Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and I'd like to thank you for joining me in another installment of our lecture series. This lecture was brought to you courtesy of Fortress of the Mind Publications, and in this lecture we'll be talking about the dream of Scipio, the dream of Scipio. In Latin it's uh, Somnium Scipionis, and the dream of Scipio is the final essay in the book that I've published, uh, Stoic Paradoxes. And you, you can find the book, again, by going to my website, qcurtius.com, looking under the tab Books, and clicking on Stoic Paradoxes, and the book is right there. If you have the book, you can follow along with the discussion. If you don't have the book, you can listen to the discussion, and that will hopefully whet your appetite for further exploration along these lines. This is, I will say, it's a, a very, to me, a very profound essay, a very deep, very profound, very, to me, emotionally moving essay, and I hope that my enthusiasm for it will carry through in this lecture and will hopefully inspire listeners to give the essay a second look if they've already read it once, and if they have never read it, then to actually plunge in and read it, because there are many layers of meaning here. This is a dense rich essay, very profound, full of meaning, and we could literally spend hours talking about it, but obviously time is limited, and we will hit the main points of discussion and inspire readers for further explorations. What I'll be doing in this lecture is discussing the main points of the essay, the main points of the essay, then we'll talk a little bit about the characters of the essay, the characters who are the mouthpieces that are featured in which Cicero uses to discuss the points that he wants to discuss, and then we'll finally end with a discussion. Now what is Dream of Scipio? What is it? Well, it is not part of Cicero's book Stoic Paradoxes. I've incorporated it into my book, into my translation, but this essay is actually was the sixth and final book of Cicero's work, De Republica, on the Republic, which was written about the year 54, 54 BC. The essay describes a, a fictional dream of a famous figure in Roman history, uh, Scipio Aemilianus, okay, who was also known as Scipio the Younger. And why did I include it in my volume, my translation of Cicero's Stoic Paradoxes. Well, I explain that in the book. And essentially, the, the short answer is simply, is simply that it forms a nice counterweight to the sternness of Stoic Paradoxes, where Stoic Paradoxes is focused on the proper conduct of, for a man's life on earth. The dream of Scipio sets its sights on the eternal glories of life after death. And this is the Dream of Scipio, it's a work of brilliantly imaginative imagery, and as far as I know, the first example in Western literature of astral projection, of astral projection, of what is that? That's basically describing an out-of-body experience by the narrator, and this situation is used as a vehicle to discuss philosophical points. What are the main points? of the dream of Scipio. Let's go over those very briefly here before we plunge into the discussion. Well, again, let's make it clear. This is an imaginative essay. This is not a recounting of a factual event. This is a philosophical essay of an imaginative nature, and it's not meant to be taken literally, even though the characters in the essay who are making the statements are, in fact, real people or are historical people. And why did Cicero do this? Well, this was a common convention in the ancient world. This was a common convention to use as mouthpieces actual historical figures who had prestige, who could be taken seriously by readers or listeners, and who could lend the force of their personalities and weightiness to the ideas discussed. And in this essay, Cicero is using some figures who were very, very famous. They may not be famous to us now, but they were famous to any 
any Roman of the day or even of the medieval era and even up until the early modern era. Uh, uh, Scipio the Elder, Scipio the Younger, uh, King Massinissa. We'll discuss who these people were, but these were very, very famous people, especially the Scipios, the Scipio family. It would be almost like if a writer was using um, uh, as a subject, say, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and having them discuss philosophical ideas. It, it, these, these men had just the same sort of, of prestige and weight in the Roman Republican era as, uh, say, Madison, Jefferson, John Adams would have had to a modern-day American. So what are the main points of the dream of Scipio? They are these. We'll go through them step by step here. And again, I'm following along from my book. I'm not reading verbatim from the book, but I'm following along from it, and I'm taking my cues in this lecture from the book. So again, I can't emphasize enough. I think it's important to, to have the book, to read the book, because even though we can spend a lot of time talking about the concepts here today in the lecture, the book really fleshes out a lot of these uh, details in much greater detail than I can give in a short lecture like this. So get the book, the footnotes, the footnotes go into a lot of detail about the philosophical subtleties, the historical subtleties that we really don't have time for in the lecture. So that's my pitch that I'll make to you uh, for getting the book. The main points of the action of the essay are these. Uh, Scipio the Younger vis visits King Massinissa, a friend of his family in North Africa, and is embraced by him warmly. They converse late into the night. And later that night, Scipio the Elder, who's also known as Africanus. Again, let me just make a uh, di digression here. In, in Roman times, it was not uncommon for famous Romans who were conquerors to take a, what was called a cognomen or a, a name from a location where they achieved military greatness. For example, Scipio the Elder, who achieved military greatness in North Africa, he was granted the cognomen Africanus. Others, other Roman generals, say, achieved military success in Macedonia, and they took that name. Uh, so this is why these cognomens are attached. In any case, Scipio the Elder appears later that night in Scipio the Younger's dream. Scipio the Younger finds himself transported to the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and he finds himself in a conversation with the spirit of the departed Scipio the Elder. So again, this is an example of astral projection, of out-of-body experience. And we have the this real-world historical figure who's being transported out of his body, out beyond the earth, beyond the confines of the earth, to have a philosophical discussion with his departed ancestor. And the Scipio the Younger is told by his elder that he will one day achieve great glory from the conquest of Carthage and Numantia. And he also tells Scipio that he will one day achieve fame as a statesman as Rome. Real patriots and good rulers, the elder says, will have eternal rewards. This reward is life after death. Life after death exists and it awaits us. The road to immortality is paved by attachment to patriotic virtues. Then Scipio the Younger sees his father Paulus. His father tells him that a man should do his duty during life and not try to abandon it or speed up his destiny. Again, a man should do his duty during life. Do not try to abandon his duty or speed up your duty. And by that method is the best way to follow one's destiny. Justice and piety, he says, are godlike virtues. For these virtues prepare the soul for transportation to heaven. Earthly concerns are small and petty. Scipio notices how small the earth is when compared with the planets and stars. And he begins to see the truth of his father's and Africanus's statements. Scipio then views the Milky Way galaxy and sees the nine heavenly spheres of the stars. He also hears the divine music of the spheres. 
and he's entranced by this, by this music, even though it can't really be heard by most mortal men. Africanus then makes the point to Scipio the Younger that only certain parts of the earth are really habitable. And he uses this fact as a way to explain to him that fame is lacking in substance and duration. Fame is not, should not be one's goal. It is better to live a virtuous life than it is to seek pointless and fleeting glory. The soul is immortal. Even though the world will eventually be consumed by fire, the soul, only the soul, is immortal. The soul rules the body just as God rules the universe. And because the soul moves itself, it can be said to be immortal. Scipio promises to devote his life to upright living and virtuous deeds. And this is the way to be certain that one soul achieves its proper destiny in its relationship with the physical body. Upon death, the spirits of bad men float about close to the earth for thousands of years until they have been polished and purified. And the final part of the essay is Scipio awakens from his dream. And that's, in a very brief nutshell, the main points of the essay. We'll discuss these ideas a little bit further. But we can see here that this is a very profound essay. There's a lot here. And it's important to note that the main influences, the main influences here to this essay are Plato. Um, Plato and Pythagoras. Cicero relies greatly on these forerunners of his for his ideas, Pythagoras and Plato. Those two giants of the history of philosophy are the main movers be behind the ideas, but Cicero's treatment of the subject is original in, in itself. It's, it's so, um, it is very, uh, it's very dense. It's very, uh, it's told in a very engaging way. And it's no accident that this is one of the reasons why this essay was preserved out of all of the rest of the book on the Republic, De Republica. This, this essay was preserved independently for many centuries before the rest of the book was discovered in the Vatican Library in the 18th century. And that's what's really one of the interesting notes about the dream of Scipio is this, the essay was known for, for many centuries, but it was, it, it was only uh, in the 18th century, I think it was about, I think it was during the 1750s, if I remember right, there was a a, um, a Jesuit who was working as the curator of the Vatican Library. His name was Angelo, uh, Angelo Mai in Latin. He Latinized his name as Angelus Maius. And he was able to decipher a, uh, a palimpsest. A palimpsest is a, it's a word that is, is, conveys a, a, a piece of parchment upon which the original writing has been sponged off and new writing has been put on. And careful observers of these parchments and, and study students of them, and, and by using uh, techniques, can read what was originally written on the palimpsest, and that was how Cicero's *On the Republic* was was originally first discovered. Even though *The Dream of Scipio* was known as a separate essay for many, many hundreds of years, and rightfully so, because it is a magnificent, uh, indeed a glorious essay, which I personally find very inspiring. And I hope listeners will also. And incidentally, the quality of the Latin prose here is just incredible. It, it, uh, it achieves heights of eloquence that even for Cicero are um, rarely achieved again, if ever. So let's now talk about, we've, we've gone over the main points of the essay. We've gone over the main points of the essay. Now let's talk about, just so you have some context, who are these historical figures that are being used as the mouthpieces of the dialogue? Who are they? Who were they? And what can we say about them? Well, Masinissa, who does not play a significant role in this essay, he was, uh, but nevertheless appears in it, he was king of Numidia in North Africa. And during the Second Punic War, he was first an ally of the Carthaginians and then switched sides to become a Roman ally 
around 204 BC. He had a close relationship with Scipio Africanus, the elder, and this was what uh, this relationship was one of the things that helped Masinissa retain his kingdom. Okay, so who who are the Scipios? The, the next, the most important thing that I think we can point out here is the lineage of the the Scipios. Scipio the Elder, Scipio the Younger. It can be very confusing here, and we should at least try to get a fix on this genealogy so that we're not totally lost. Scipio the Elder. Scipio the Elder, he was also known as Scipio Africanus. He lived from uh, 236 to 183 BC, and again, he was a incredible military uh, virtuoso and achieved greatness on the battlefield. His son, Scipio the Elder's son, was a man named Paulus. And I'm sorry, no. His son was named was um, was was Publius Scipio. He was the son of Scipio the Elder. And so even I get confused. <laughs> so Scipio the Elder's son was Publius Scipio, and he adopted Scipio the Younger. Okay, and Scipio the Younger is also called Scipio Aemilianus. And all of this is described in great detail in the book, in the footnotes, in various different places. So I don't want to dwell on it too much. It's not something that we need to get caught up in and, and worried about, uh, you know, in a great way. But we should at least know who these people, uh, uh, who, who these people were. For those who are truly interested in the lineages and genealogies here, I give it on page 49 of the book in one of the footnotes. Actually, it's footnote 25 on page 49, and I'll read it. Publius Cornelius Scipio Emilianus, uh, who lived from 185 to 129 BC. He was known as Scipio the Younger. He was a Roman general who presided over the final destruction of Carthage during the Third Punic War. Scipio Aemilianus had been adopted by Publius Cornelius Scipio, the eldest son of Scipio the Elder. And to complicate matters even further, Scipio Aemilianus the Younger also happened to be the first cousin of his adopted father. So, just an interesting genealogical point. It's not critical to our understanding of the essay, but it's nice to know who these people were. So let's dive in now into the action of the essay. It starts out, Scipio the Younger is visiting uh, King Masinissa, and he is given a warm welcome by him, and they discuss various different matters, and they reminisce about, uh, about Scipio the Elder and how great of a man he was and various different things. And then uh, Scipio the Younger takes to his bed to sleep for the night, and suddenly he finds himself transported to the stars. And he is finds himself discussing different matters with Scipio the Elder, who tells him that someday you will achieve great triumphs. You will achieve great triumph in the capital, and you will find the Republic in great danger from various different plots. But you will triumph over these plots. And he basically tells him, he says, look, all of those men who protected, helped, or contributed to their countries occupy a special and defined place in heaven where they can enjoy a life of eternal bliss. So here the, the point is patriotism. Now this idea may seem old-fashioned to us in our modern cynical way of viewing things, but patriotism was very important to the Romans. They took it seriously. And who can say that maybe someday that virtue will come back into vogue in our modern Western existence. But for now, it's safe to say that it's not really as popular or, or as meaningful as it used to be. I mean, we, we use it as a punchline. 
we mouth, we genuflect to the altar of patriotism, we, we use it when we need to use it, but I suspect that there are very there are there are few leaders today who truly take it seriously the way the Romans of old did. And Scipio the Elder tells him, he says, the helmsmen and protectors of civil states are great men. They come they come from great stuff and they will return to great stuff, meaning to heaven where, where he is. Now Scipio the Younger is terrified from all this, from hearing all this. He doesn't know what to make of it. He's trying to get a fix on his emotions. He's trying to decide what it is that he thinks. And Scipio the Older, the Elder tells him, says, look, get a grip on yourself here. You know, the the um, you must remember to cultivate your justice and piety as, as legitimate virtues. And this is the road to heaven. This life of justice and piety is the true road to heaven. And the men of history who have followed these principles have never failed to achieve greatness. So Scipio the Younger is taking all of this in and he you know finds all this hard to accept and there's a point in the dialogue where he sees his father coming towards him and this is on page 91 of the book and he says um, Scipio the Elder tells Scipio the Younger he says do you not see your father coming to you and the Younger sees him and then is weeping intensely and his, his, the ghost of his father embraced him and kissed him and told him, you know, do not cry. So you have the, the, the three of them up there among the Milky Way galaxy discussing these philosophical concepts. And it sounds maybe odd to us, but it really isn't. It's a very, to me anyway, it's a very tender scene. It's a very moving scene. And you have these three generations of Scipios. You have Scipio the Elder, the father of Scipio the Younger, and Scipio the Younger himself up there talking about what it is that makes men great. What is the true nature of greatness and what is those? what are those things that make a man immortal and what are the things that we should value in life. Now, Scipio the Younger is finding himself sort of awestruck by everything that's happened. He doesn't really know what to think or what to do. And finally, Africanus, who's the elder, says, How long are you going to look down at the earth below? Do you not see what sort of a celestial temple you have come to? And he talks about the, the nine orbs, the nine heavenly spheres. Now, this is clearly showing the influence of the Platonic and Pythagorean cosmological system. I'm not going to get into a lot of detail of this because I go into it enough in the footnotes to the book and I don't really need to discuss it here at great length, but it was thought uh, by Plato and Pythagoras that the visible universe was comprised of these perfect spheres, the visible planets, okay? And each of them was thought to have special significance. Again, I don't want to go into a lot of this because then we're getting more into mystical and astronomical things that are not directly relevant to what we're talking about here. But those who are interested in such things can find them fully described in the footnotes to the book. And once Scipio the Younger has observed these planets and their movement around him, as he sees them in their wondrous movements, he says, what is this sweet sound that is filling my ears? And his father and grandfather tell him, he said that they say, this is the sound produced by the acceleration and motion of these celestial spheres, separated in unequal intervals, but occupying distinct measured proportions and making high and low sounds with a varying and equal unity. And again, I don't want to get into a lot of detail about this, but this also ties into Plato's and the Greek theory of music, about how these divine proportions also had musical significance. But it's interesting stuff. It's very, very interesting stuff. And if, um, if you find yourself interested in these things, I suggest you 
read the footnotes in great detail there where you can find all these things uh, amplified. But where it really gets important, it says here that the three of them are looking down on the earth and, Scip and uh, Scipio the Elder basically tells them, he says, look, uh, the earth appears to be small and it is small. You know, and he uses the smallness of the earth as a way to point out the silliness of our obsession with worldly desires. He says, what fame can you achieve from the words of men or what desired glory can you achieve from the words of men? You can see here that the earth really is only inhabited in a, in a few sparse and narrow spots. And between the places where people live are vast empty regions, the polar caps, the oceans, so that no real communication is possible between these groups. These people are located in places sometimes oblique, sometimes transverse, and sometimes adverse to us. And from this fact, we can expect no glory. So this is a, a key point of the essay, is that all glory is fleeting. The things that we obsess about, the things that we think are so important, really have very, very little significance once we step back and look at things from the perspective, from the vantage point of literally being outside the earth. And this ties into many of the Stoic principles that I discussed in some of the previous lectures that we've given here. Almost without knowing it, Cicero has reintroduced Stoic principles into this essay and really shown us his belief in these concepts and his adherence to these principles. And it's, it's really very, uh, a very moving way he puts, the, uh, puts the, the points here. He says, he says look, look down upon the earth. All of that land which is occupied, uh, you know, can you, can't you see that's only a small island surrounded by that great body of water that you call the Atlantic Ocean or that great expanse, um, you know, the other oceans? Despite its name, can't you see it's only tiny? You know, from these same settled and known lands, which you can see from here, can your name or anyone else's name spill over in significance beyond the Caucasus Mountains or swim the immense Ganges River? Who in the other parts of the world will ever hear the sound of your name? Who will ever hear your name? And taking away these regions for the moment, it's clear that your immortal glory really spreads over, over a pathetically narrow area. And will those who talk about us now ever talk about us in the future? Will descendants, will our remote descendants in future gen generations ever want to talk about us or concern ourselves with us? No, he says, it's, it's foolish to worry about these things. Scipio the Elder says, why does it matter that those who are before, though, why does it matter that those who are born after you? Um, uh, he says, what, why does it matter that, why does it matter when those that were born after you may talk about you, when you gain nothing from those who lived before you? And that's something that we should really think about. I'll read it again. Why does it matter when those who were born after you may talk about you? when you yourself gain nothing from those who were, who lived before you. So what, 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 of what importance is fame? Of what significance is fame? And this is why we should never surrender our identity to the whisperings of the mob, nor place our hopes in human rewards for our ambitions. Virtue alone, virtue alone, Scipio says, should be enough of an inducement, should be enough of an allurement to carry you on to true glory. That's what matters. Not these vague and transitory ideas about fame. Never was the glory of any man permanent. It was always overwhelmed by oblivion or extinguished by the indifference of posterity. And again, very, very profound, very profound uh, concepts here. And this is the ultimate point of what Scipio is getting at, this is really where he gets to the heart of the matter here. He says, you must exert yourself forward. Know that only your body is mortal, but not you yourself. You are not this form taken by your body, but instead the mind contained within it. 
You are not some random shape that can be pointed at with an index finger. Know then that you are a god. If a god is a being which feels, which is vigorous, which remembers, which provides, which rules, which controls, and moves the physical body which is which it is put in charge of. It is analogous to how God on high is the ruler of the physical world. And just as this same eternal God moves the world, of which some part is mortal, so an imperishable spirit moves this fragile body of ours. In other words, the body is transitory, but the soul is immortal. Our soul really is our identity. It is a prime mover. It does not it moves itself. It is not acted on by any external force. Other bodies, other corporeal objects, are moved by action of external forces, but not the soul. And it's because of this that we know the soul is immortal. And this is a very, again, a very profound concept that which has antecedents in, in both Plato and Aristotle. The idea of the soul as a prime mover. Now, what does that mean, a prime mover? Well, it is a first principle. It is not moved um, by external action. It moves itself. And the logic here is that if something moves itself, then it must be eternal. And so this is the argument. He says a first principle that has been destroyed is neither reborn from something else nor will be created from something else because all things are born from this first principle. So, things that are set in motion by external forces are all inanimate. A living animal is moved by an internal force all its own. And this is the appropriate nature of how we should see the soul. And since out of all things, the soul is the only one to move itself, it cannot be said to have been born, but rather it must be eternal. So, this really is getting to the heart of the idea, of the, the main idea of the dream of Scipio, the idea that our souls are immortal and that we must cultivate them, we must polish them so that they will find a special place in heaven. There are a few other ancillary points that I'll just mention here in passing that are discussed in the essay. One is the idea of a, a great year, which is a very interesting cosmological concept. It doesn't directly impact on the ideas we've discussed, but I'll mention it anyway because it's of uh, interesting significance. Basically, going back to this idea of the movement of the planets of the heavenly spheres, uh, Cicero basically says that they only come into alignment but once every, you know, 12 or, or 15,000 years. And this is a great year. This is the idea of a, of a great year. And again, this is this is a concept that Cicero took from one of the Platonic dialogues, one of Plato's dialogues, the Phaedrus, Phaedrus, and we can find it there if we're interested. And another concept, another spiritual concept discussed in the essay towards the end is the idea that souls that are less than perfect, that are imperfect, that are tainted by sin, they will not be able to reach heaven. They will have to fly about the earth for thousands of years until they are cleansed and purified and only then can they enter heaven. So these are the main points of the, the essay of uh, the Dream of Scipio. And again, why do I find it inspiring? Well, I find it inspiring because of the emotional content. It's very, I think, uh, a very uh, compelling image to have three generations of great men uh, out in the ether discussing the nature of greatness, what makes man good, what makes virtue, what makes uh, the soul an, an immortal uh, quality. And it's also invigorating to hear that, to hear fully expressed the idea that, that, that we should not be chasing fame or chasing glory, that all such glory is fleeting. And so often we lose perspective. So often, we, so often we get caught up in our own mindless affairs day to day that we forget this compelling and powerful concept, the idea that everything that we busy ourselves about, everything that we obsess about constantly, 
ultimately has very little meaning once we step back and see it from the perspective of outside the earth. Never mind forest for the trees. If we get literally outside the earth itself, we will see just how pathetic and just how insignificant our affairs truly become. And I think this is perhaps the greatest and major point of the essay, the idea that all glory is fleeting. And we can be inspired by this. And what I'll do now, because I can't resist, I'd like to read for you in Latin, just again so you could hear what it would have sounded like one of the most, I think, prof profound and compelling sentences in the dialogue. So let me do that here. And this passage I'm taking from page 100 of my book. And I'll read the original just so you can get an idea of what it what it would have sounded like, the, the grandeur of the of the prose. Cicero says, Deum te igator scito esse, si quidem es Deus qui viget, qui sentit, qui meminit, qui providet, qui tam regit et moderator et movet et corpus qui praepositus est, quam hunc mundum ille princeps Deus, et ut mundum ex quadam parte mortale nipse Deus aeternus, sic fragile corpus animus sempiternus movet. And what that means, how that's translated is this, and it's, just, it's such a wonderful sentence. He says, know then that you are a God. If a God is a being which feels, which is vigorous, which remembers, provides, rules, controls, and directs the physical body, which it is put in charge of. It is analogous to how God on high is the ruler of the physical world. Just as this same eternal God moves the world, of which some part is mortal, so an imperishable spirit moves this fragile body of ours. Again, the main points of the essay, all glory is fleeting. The great virtues that a great man should cultivate are piety, are patriotism, and attention scrupulous attention to duty, and as high a level of moral perfection as one can possibly attain. And in this way, we can preserve and realize the eternality, the immortality, if you will, of our souls, so that they are assured of their proper place in that pantheon of great men out there in the sky in heaven, if we wish to believe the cosmology presented to us by Cicero, which we can either believe it literally, or we can take it as a philosophical exercise. It really doesn't matter. Again, this is not really about getting into theological principles or, or uh, digressions or diversions. It, our attention really should be focused on what are the ethical and moral points of the essay. So I hope you'll take this lecture as a cue to explore further the dream of Scipio. Again, it's a very rich essay, and I've only really scratched the surface here with this lecture. And it's really going to be up to you now to take the bull by the horns, to read the essay, and to see what riches it can yield up for your own explorations and study. And I think the best way to handle these types of philosophical essays, read it Put it aside, listen to my lecture, and then read it again. And you'll find that it has a whole new meaning to you once you've explored it in these different ways. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. It was brought to you courtesy of Fortress of the Mind Publications. You can find my book, Stoic Paradoxes, from which this essay was taken by going to my website, qcurtius.com and finding it there. And if you enjoyed this lecture, I would ask you to please rate it on iTunes so that others can find it. I'm Quintus Curtius. Thank you for joining us. Good night.